Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd and this is my review of episode 8 of season 2 of Star Trek Strange New Worlds called Under the Cloak of War. And in my opinion, I think it might be the best episode of the show so far. And I would even go as far as saying maybe this is on a Deep Space Nine level of writing. They finally did an episode about something. It wasn't just for show, it wasn't just for special effects, it wasn't just style over substance, but the writing came first and the characters came first and it was all very complex and complicated, multi-layered. And the fact that it's also morally ambiguous and in the gray area is what makes it great because this way we can literally debate about it forever. The way they made a few scenes deliberately unclear, deliberately ambiguous, literally behind the blurry glass that we don't exactly saw what happened in the end. And so we can interpret it in different ways and the whole overall idea of it, of what is right and wrong, is also something that we can debate about it literally forever. And that is something that I was always saying, I am waiting for an episode like this. An episode about some kind of idea that we can actually discuss on an intellectual level. And that makes it interesting. And uh, when I compare it with Deep Space Nine, the obvious comparison is to some of the Dominion War episodes, you know, showing the horrors of war and the PTSD. But this episode goes beyond that because it also deals with issues of uh, justice, morality, redemption, and all of it interwoven together in what I think is a brilliant way. And it reminds me of that episode of Deep Space Nine called Duet, which was about Kira confronting someone who she thinks is a former Cardassian war criminal who was guilty of genocide and in the end it turns out he was actually not that war criminal, he was pretending to be him because he wanted to be punished because he felt so guilty about what happened when he actually just served under the command of that guy. And in this episode it's something similar but almost in reverse. It's someone who admits he was a war criminal but pretends to be reformed and redeemed and is trying to do some good and it's not really that clear in this episode how genuine he really is. We do know for a fact that he told a few lies that his story is not exactly straight but he also explained why he had to do it and so it's kind of unclear and that's what's so good about it that we don't really know is he really redeemed, is he really a good guy now or is he just pretending for personal gain. And that's part of what makes it so ambiguous. It kind of reminds me of the character of Tilk from uh, Stargate SG-1, who started out as a villain. He was working for the big bad of the show. He was killing innocent people and all of that. And yet at a certain point, he switched sides and uh, started fighting for the humans against the Gauld and trying to redeem for what he previously done. And for the purposes of the show, he was pretty much a good guy after that. And there were a few episodes that touched upon the past. There was some planet that captured him and wanted to put him on trial for killing some of the innocent people on that planet before and in the end they kind of forgave him. And I thought that was also an interesting episode about, you know, maybe Tilk should be punished for what he did previously. Just because he switched sides suddenly, does it automatically redeem him for all the sins he did previously? And so this episode is similar in that regard that it actually deals on this topic which is not a black and white topic. We can debate about it forever. It's complicated. And also, you know, in the end, Joseph said that that guy literally killed children personally, and yet we never saw it. And so we don't know how true it is or not. And in that final fight between them, everything was happening behind the blurred glass and Nurse Chapel came in late. So she didn't really see exactly what happened. And so part of it is up to our imagination, our interpretation. And that is what I was begging for. I was constantly saying in my reviews of the new track shows, why are they not doing any morality tales anymore? Why are they not discussing any ethical issues anymore? And I cited as examples some of the episodes in the old shows, in Deep Space Nine and in Voyager, when they raised uh, all kinds of issues which did not have a right or wrong answer. Ones that we can literally debate forever because the line is blurred and we don't know exactly what we would do in that situation. You know, all those morally shady things that Cisco had to do to win the war, for example, was it justified? Because if he didn't do that, then many more people would have died. And so it's the classic morality question, would you sacrifice one innocent person to save uh, 10 people. And you know, in Voyager, there was the episode two weeks in which it's literally 50-50 when Janeway has to sacrifice two weeks to save Neelix and Tuvok, 
who merged into two weeks and so two weeks did not want to be separated back into them because it's like killing him and yet she did it to save two people for the expense of one. I still say that episode is slightly dark, like especially the way she did it, kind of by force, instead of trying to convince him, or at least do it in his sleep without scaring him or something. The way she kind of brutally did it, I still would say it's kind of immoral the way it was shown, but the bigger question was justified because she was technically fixing a transporter malfunction and saving two people on the expense of one, so I would say it's kind of 50-50 on the morality. You don't really know the right answer in that situation. So those kinds of episodes, I think, are clever and brilliant because they make us talk about such issues and debate it literally forever because there is no strict right or wrong answer. And that's what they did in this episode. On the one hand, they tell us that this guy is a war criminal who committed genocide, who killed innocent civilians, and yet we don't directly see him doing that. On the other hand, he appears to be generally reformed. He tries to do some good. He tries to be a peacemaker and redeem for his uh, crimes and all of that. We also know that he lied when he said that he killed his own men who were uh, the ones guilty for the atrocities, that he was appalled by those atrocities and that's why he killed them and escaped. But we later find out it was actually Joseph who did that and that guy is lying about it. But just because he lied about it, it doesn't mean that he lies about everything else. Maybe he's not pretending to be remorseful and we do know that he is doing some good. So in the end of the day, I understand both sides of it. I understand Joseph's side because he says that there needs to be some justice. That guy needs to be punished for what he did. On the other hand, maybe that guy truly is redeemed. And we do know that he's doing some good in the universe, uh, trying to create peace and all of that. So in the end of the day, the bigger picture, in my opinion, is the more important thing. And so if that guy is truly doing some good work and doing some uh, peace efforts and all of that then I would give him the benefit of the doubt and I would allow that good work to continue. So in the end of the day, I do kind of condemn Joseph for what he did. On the other hand, it's understandable as well and it's making him a more complicated and interesting character. And because we didn't see exactly what happened behind that glass, maybe that guy did attack him and it was self-defense. We don't exactly know. We do see him opening that box with the knife even before he entered. So he was kind of considering it even before apparently. And in the end, they kind of lied and claimed that the knife belonged to the butcher of the Klingons. And so it's like they're framing this Klingon for uh, attacking him with the knife, while in reality it was probably reversed, and yet we didn't exactly see how it happened. And so that's what makes it so brilliant, because we can literally discuss and debate it forever, just like in some of the classic episodes of Trek. And the way they kind of tread carefully right in the middle to make it unclear, did that guy really kill children? We didn't see it. We don't really know if he did or if he ordered it. And did Joseph really kill him in cold blood or was it really self-defense? We don't exactly see it. And so that's why it's so good. Because if they were not this careful, then we would all agree what is right or wrong in this situation. But the fact that we, they didn't show us everything, that's what makes it so ambiguous in the gray area. And that's why it's so brilliant. I mean, we do know that that Klingon lied about his past by pretending that he killed the other Klingons and blaming everything on them. So he is kind of dishonorable. He is kind of a liar. But he also explains that he did it for a good reason so that Starfleet will trust him so that he can do some good and redeem his actions. And we literally see him crying when he talks about everything. And he seems to be genuinely like a good guy. So is it all pretense or is it true? Or even if he is pretending but he's still doing some good work, maybe it's uh, better for the bigger picture and so it was a mistake to kill him if that's the case. And by the way, him crying is kind of a continuity issue because it was directly mentioned by Spock in Star Trek VI that Klingons have no tear ducts. But we also did see some other Klingons shedding tears, uh, like Worf's brother was crying in one scene of Deep Space Nine. And there was that tale that Worf told about Kales, who wept and filled the oceans with his tears. And so obviously Klingons can cry, so that makes it a continuity mistake, kind of only in that movie. Also, I think it was only in the director's cut. It wasn't in the theatrical version, so maybe it's not canon. Or maybe Spock was just lying as usual, because with all these retcons and prequels and all of that, it makes Spock seem like a compulsive liar, because he constantly makes uh, things up. It's like uh, Obi-Wan in Star Wars. It's only true from a certain point of view kind of thing. So anyway, the tears of this Klingon here, 
I think it's a good thing because it shows that he's uh, not pretending. You cannot just cry on Q so easily, especially for a Klingon. So maybe he truly is remorseful. And yet Joseph doesn't believe him because he says it cannot be so easy. And also across this episode, this Klingon is not really acting like a Klingon. He seems way too gentle and kind and caring and friendly, kind of too much. And so the fact that he's so friendly makes him seem so un-Klingon that it might be another clue that he's faking all of it, that it's all a fake persona. He's not really so friendly as he pretends to be. Also the fact that he walks with a cane all the time and yet there was that scene when he's uh, training in the martial arts with Mabenga and suddenly fights so well and all of that and uh, after they finish the fight then he picks up the cane again and then walks again. And so it's like in that Yoda scene in Star Wars when Yoda suddenly dropped the cane and became a martial artist jumping all over the walls and then picking up the cane again making it look as if he's just faking his need for the cane. So the same here with this Klingon, so he doesn't really need the cane, so why does he use it? Only to make himself look like an old wise man and not a scary Klingon? So there are all these subtle clues across this episode that maybe this guy really is pretending to be like the Dalai Lama and all of that, which by the way was mentioned directly in the dialogue, which was a little bit annoying when Ortega mentioned how everyone is treating this guy like he's the Dalai Lama and not a war criminal. And that reference kind of annoyed me because, you know, it's too modern. This is supposed to be centuries in the future. So maybe they should have used some different name and not something from today. And uh, another slight continuity mistake was when they tried to give him some Raktagino to drink. And we literally see a replicator creating that drink out of thin air on the platform. And that kind of annoyed me because, you know, there are direct lines of dialogue in Voyager when Harry Kim said that he studied this period of history in the Academy and directly said there were no replicators in the 23rd century when discussing the era of TOS, which was even after the show. And we do know there are those food slots and matter synthesizers and yet we never directly saw it being formed from thin air on a platform like uh, the replicators of the 24th century. So it seemed way too advanced for this time period. And we can say it's because of the changes in the timeline and technically they never called it a replicator so maybe it's just a synthesizer and yet it works exactly like a replicator. It did have some glitches because it makes it either too cold or too hot and when that Klingon tries to pick it up it's too hot and then it burns his hand and for a moment we also see him kind of getting angry and uh, enraged but kind of controlling it which was another clue that maybe he's just pretending to be a good guy because he's suddenly so forgiving. And he says it's a good thing that Klingons are so tolerable of pain or something like that. It also reminds me of that scene from Discovery when that Klingon Vok was burning his own hand on a fire to show how he's so tough and all of that. So if Klingons can do that so easily and don't require any medical attention, how come this Klingon has to immediately go to sickbay to treat his hand after it got slightly burned by that hot drink? And that's when Mabenga first sees him and then he has like a nervous breakdown from seeing a Klingon and on my first viewing I was annoyed by that because I thought it's just his reaction to seeing a Klingon. And I thought it's kind of over exaggerated the way he almost has a heart attack and I thought it's over exaggerated. On my second viewing it's much more understandable because it's much more personal, it's this specific Klingon that he wanted to kill in the past and so now it makes sense that he has this reaction also it might be tied uh, to the drug that he was taking because in those flashback scenes to the war we saw that he was taking the drug and he was talking about the negative side effects and so maybe it's partly psychological as well maybe because he took the drug when he was trying to kill this guy that when he sees him again in the future it kind of causes him this uh, side effect and so we can explain it that way as well and speaking of all those flashbacks in the past, I thought they were actually really well done. They showed us uh, Nurse Chapel arriving to that base that is receiving all the wounded constantly. And uh, they showed us the horrors of war and all of that. A lot of it was really graphic. And they also show us uh, how Mabenga invented that method of storing someone in the transporter buffer, which uh, is kind of a continuity issue with TNG because, you know, in TNG when they found Scotty, who stored himself in the transporter for 70 something years and they were all so amazed by that and they implied that Scotty was the first one ever to invent it. And yet according to this show, it's Joseph who invented it and didn't tell anyone else apparently. No one else in Starfleet ever thought of using it again. So that is kind of uh, not logical. We know that he stored his daughter in such a way as well in the previous season and they complained about it back then as well. So now it turns out he invented it even before that during the war. And there's also a scene in which after they stored someone there and then later they had to receive more wounded 
and they had to purge the member of the transporter and sacrifice that guy basically. So that was another kind of morally shady thing to do. But at least in that case, they didn't really have a choice. So it made sense, but it kind of showed how he's willing to do the necessary evil act for the greater good and so on. And visually all those scenes were pretty good as well. They kind of show us a planet which uh, once again has all those spiky mountains. It does uh, work in this case because it kind of shows that place to be hellish. Like it's literally hell in which people are constantly dying all around you in uh, great pain and all of that. And it helped uh, to set everything up. And some of those actual scenes reminded me of some of those future war scenes in the Terminator franchise. Even some of the sound effects were similar and so they literally show us like a horrific future war kind of thing. And I now understand why they were setting Joseph up the way they were in the first episodes of the season which initially kind of annoyed me. I thought that they were just doing it as a gimmick to try to make him more cool, to make him like you know Blade the, the vampire killer suddenly he's such a badass who can kill people easily and all of that and I thought it's just a gimmick but now I see that they did it as a kind of a setup to this episode. And uh, we see this Andorian soldier who tries to get his help to get some more of that serum that he invented. And uh, there's a scene when he talks to a guy that he helped uh, save his life uh, when he was wounded. And then he goes back into the action. And then later he sees that he died. He sees the bodies of uh, children and all of that, and which helps explain what happens in the future. You know, back in the future, he constantly having to hold himself back not to kill this Klingon basically because he knows he's guilty for all of that and yet he's now a diplomat and all of that so he's constantly having to restrain himself and it was all done really well. The acting was brilliant and uh, there was that scene in the sonic shower when he's having the flashbacks and all of that so everything was really well filmed and well acted and well written and the fact it's all morally ambiguous and that ending which was definitely dark and shady and I don't justify Joseph, obviously he did kind of uh, frame that guy and yet they kept it right on the edge of not being too clear on either side and so that's why it's not cut and dry clear. Overall I do think Joseph made the wrong choice. If that guy is now a peacemaker and on their side basically then maybe he should have been forgiven. Even if he's not totally honest, even if he did lie about a few things, maybe Joseph should have allowed him to keep those secrets for the greater good. Maybe that would have been a better sacrifice to make. Just let the anger go and allow that guy to continue his good works, even if he's not being totally honest, even if he is pretending. As long as he's doing a good thing now, maybe it would have been the Star Trek way or the Starfleet way to give him a second chance, just like Pike was saying. And yet Joseph then talks about, you know, all the victims, that they do deserve justice and all of that. But, you know, when you go into that approach, then it's an endless cycle of violence. Then he basically becomes like a Klingon. And uh, I'm sure some people will say, oh, this makes uh, his character irredeemable now because he killed that Klingon who was a peacemaker now and yet he killed him with that knife and then framed him and lied about it. So he's kind of irredeemable character now. And there is something to that as well. On the other hand, we did have characters in the past in Star Trek who did morally shady things, you know, like Garrick and Cisco. And the characters such as Worf, you know, there was the episode when he let some Romulan die because he didn't want to donate his blood to him. And he killed Duras and he killed Gauron for the greater good and all of that. So he definitely did some morally shady things as well. But uh, I guess because he's a Klingon, we immediately forgave him and continued to like this character. And just because Joseph is a human and not a Klingon, suddenly it's not okay. And the fact that he did kill this Klingon in the end is the reason that we will be debating about it forever. Was it justified or not? You know, it's like in that scene in TNG when Data was about to kill Fajo and was beamed out in the last second and then they found out that he actually did fire the phaser and then he lied about it to Riker and said maybe there was a malfunction in a transporter. I didn't really fire the phaser and yet we know that he probably did and yet it was justified to do it in that situation because Fajo was a murderer who killed people and would have continued doing it and so Data was fully justified to try to kill him, to end all of that. And yet that show was not brave enough to actually have him do it because they didn't want Data to become a killer in the show, even though it would have been justified in that situation. And so these are some of the examples for the morally shady things in the gray area that we'll debate about forever. And if Mabenga did not kill this Klingon in the end, then it wouldn't be such a debate. Then we would all say... Oh, so he let that guy off with a warning, he did the morally uh, correct thing by forgiving him or whatever, but then it wouldn't be as interesting because he did kill him 
and covered it up with a lie, then it makes it all much more shady, much more complicated, much more complex, much more layered, much more of a gray area of morality and all of that. And that's what makes it so interesting. Another interesting little detail is how a few times in this episode the doctor is repairing an unstable biobed which keeps breaking down, he says, ever since the attack by the Gorn in the previous season. And it works fine for a while and then it breaks down again and he has to fix it all the time. So that was obviously kind of a metaphor to himself and his own soul. And the episode even ends with that bed uh, kind of breaking down again. And so I thought it was kind of a cute little metaphor to himself. Maybe there will be some more consequences to all of this. Maybe it will haunt him. Maybe he'll regret this decision. Maybe the next time he'll be in such a situation, he'll do the opposite choice because of it. So this opens the door for so many interesting things. And so for the first time in this show, I felt the episode was actually about something which we can actually discuss and debate and not just talk about how pretty it was on screen. And so that's why I think it was a very good episode, maybe even the best episode. I was very entertained by last week's episode with the Lower Decks crossover because it was very entertaining and funny and hilarious and yet uh, it was forgettable. So it was funny, it was enjoyable, but then there's nothing really to think about. And yet this episode has actual substance to it because it has a topic which we can discuss and debate. And that's what I always said the best episodes of Star Trek were making us do. And even if the characters make the wrong choice, it's still good as long as the episode overall presents us with the question of morality or ethics or whatever. So as long as the question is still there and it's an open question, even if the characters did something we disagree on, it's still okay. The characters don't have to be perfect and make the best decisions every single time. That would be boring. But because they are flawed and complicated and make mistakes, that's what makes it more interesting. So overall, I give this episode a 10 out of 10. And I would love to hear what you have to say about it. We can discuss all of it in the comment section below. And I will see you all next time. Bye bye.